Hi, my name is Nadej Cezana. I go by Nan. And in this series right now, we explore why I'm so much more than just a weight loss coach, where I really want you to be clear as to what you want. Is it weight loss? Is it health? Is it happiness? What does that mean? Is it all of the above? and so much more, so that if you're clear on what you want, then it's so much easier for you to go and get it, right? So last week, I explained how I was qualified actually to introduce myself as a weight loss coach. I've got two certifications via the Life Coach School, but also via the NoBS University with Corinne Crabtree. And on a regular basis, on a daily basis, I help my clients lose weight. So I could say, I'm a weight loss coach, but I'm deciding not to, and here's why, right? I explained last week that weight is just a number. It's not a problem unless we decide that it is a problem, right? And I want you to decide for yourself, there's no right or wrong uh, answer, whether for you, your weight, the actual number on the scale is a problem or not. If it is a problem, then why is it a problem? That's what we are going to explore today, actually, right? So uh, today I want to question this notion of overweight. If you decide your weight is a problem, it may be because you're thinking that you're overweight. Now, I want us to challenge that concept to make sure that we like what it means. So how do we know if you, we are overweight? How do we define overweight? That's what we're going to explore today. We also going to explore what we do once we've decided, once we've labeled ourselves as overweight, okay? We're going to talk about that today. The first thing is how do we know if we're overweight? And there's a distinction that's very important to be made here. Is it, is it an opinion or is it official? Is it something factual, common, global, depending on standards that everybody would agree on, right? In other words, words, who or what determines overweight? So let's explore the who first before we move on to the what. Did somebody actually tell you you are overweight, right? And if so, then who was it? Was it your mum? Was it your doctor? Was it your partner? Was it your best friend? Was it your arch enemy? Was it a social stranger on the street? Was it you in the mirror, right? very different, right? And maybe this person, this total stranger, maybe your best friend is also a doctor, right? So that's interesting also to consider. And then what was this opinion based on? Was it based on facts or just a story, right? And if it's based on facts, then what data determines overweight, right? And then we're going to explore that a little bit because I love to go deep. What do you make of this data? Do we want to agree with it? Why? Right? Do we want to approve of it? Do we want to do something about it? And why? All right. So I'll start by sharing my example. When I was a teenager, my parents, who are not doctors, based on my physical appearance, started describing me to myself, to friends of theirs, as overweight right? And them being the figure of authority they were for me in my life at that time, I believed them, right? So I decided to think I'm overweight, right? Now, when I look back on my teenage years, I weighed 10 kilos less, that's about two, uh, 20 pounds less than I do today. And today, we're going to talk more about this in detail, but today my weight is considered normal, according to the BMI, the body mass index. So of course, when I was a teenager, many years ago, I was also in this healthy range. The thing is that my parents were probably worried, afraid, they were seeing my body changing, and they also knew that I had a sweet tooth, so they, that it was their way of warning me, right? Careful, don't eat too much, pay attention to your figure and so on. Based on many reasons, in our society, we're going to talk about that actually next week, right? So yes, they were worried. They had good reasons, according to them, to tell me I was overweight, even though it was an opinion. It was not factual, right? But then I decided that it was a valid opinion. I didn't know any better. That's okay. But today, 
there is actually data. There is one common standard that is used all around the world, even though not exactly the same way, which is also interesting, but there is something, a standard. It's called the body mass index. I've just mentioned it. The body mass index is actually the ratio between your height, how tall you are, and your weight, how heavy or light, depending on how you want to see it, you are on a scale, right? So what's the, num what's the number on the scale? And what's the number uh, with a tape measure, maybe if you want, right? So there are different varieties, there are different ranges rather of BMI. And BMI, basically to put it very simply, BMI is considered healthy, normal, when it's roughly between 20 and 25, right? And what's really interesting about the BMI is that it's super convenient. It's super convenient to use, it's easy. It's simple. All you need are two numbers, how tall you are, how heavy you are, and that's it. So it's fantastic to establish preliminary diagnosis. And uh, it's also something international, right? Something that lots of people understand. But what's problematic then is that it's so broad, it's so simple that of course, it's the other side of the coin, it can't be as accurate as we'd love it to. It's just one metric, just one, that determines your overall health. So of course it's not very detailed, it's quite vague, right? It makes perfect sense. The problem is that it's also irrelevant. If we consider the weight um, uh, as far as the height is concerned, then we can have two very different body shapes, very different bo body compositions. Like for instance, if you have a bodybuilder compared to an obese person, you have two very different bodies. You can see they're different. And also the health behind it is probably very different, right? So we know that muscle weighs more than fat, right? So it's it could mean that on paper, the athlete, the bodybuilder looks actually unhealthy, whereas the, the obese person doesn't look as unhealthy. So it can be very misleading if we only focus on that one metric, which is the body mass index. And you can be healthy and overweight then, depending according to that BMI index, right? So that's where it can be misleading and tricky. It's not enough of a metric, of a measurement. Also, may, we, it might be interesting to consider the origin of the BMI. When it was first invented, created, more than a century ago, it was based on Scottish Highland soldiers and French gendarmerie, so policemen basically, which means that it was designed as a metric for European men. Of course, not considering uh, older people, people who would not be men, like for instance, women, <laughs> and people who were not European, all right? It doesn't consider the, difference, the differences in shapes and sizes, ethnicities. It doesn't take into account women, men who are not European, as I said, but also the frame, right? Whether you're large or small, it doesn't take that into account. And I think that was the issue when we think about my teenage years and my parents deciding to label me as overweight. My mom is rather petite, but I'm not. I've got the same build as my father's mother, right? So I've got broad shoulders and so on. Compared to my mom, everything's relative. And so, of course, when I was a teenager and my parents saw my body changing, they thought I was gaining weight, which was also true. Of course, I was <laughs> growing up. But it turns out it's simply my frame, the way my body is. So there was no potential danger. My bone structure is nothing to be afraid of unless I decide there's something there, that it's a problem. It was not actually, it turned out it was not. But the BMI index also doesn't take into account the, the build, right, the frame. It also doesn't take into account the fact that we tend to get shorter as we get older, right? So once more, the loss of height through aging is not taken, taken into account. So the BMI, looks super interesting. It's simple to use, it's easy to use, it's understood globally, but it's not accurate. So what are the metrics 
can help us determine whether we overweight or not. And of course, scientists being curious, and I love that about them, they came up with additional metrics, like for instance, the weight circumference. And you simply measure the, your waist, basically. And it's interesting because apparently it tells you where, whether your, your organs, like your stomach, your bowels are surrounded with fat or not. And that's linked to higher risks of type 2 diabetes, dyslipidemia, I'm not sure what it is, hypertension, heart diseases, right? So it's linked to diseases that we know of, that we are aware of, all right? So it seems to be a better indicator than purely and simply BMI. So it's good to know. We have other ways to measure things. There's also something that really blew my mind, the body composition. So the body composition is simply, um, you step on a scale, for instance, there are different ways to measure it, but you can simply step on a scale, which will tell you your weight, but also what your body is made of. And basically it can tell you about the body fat, your percentage of body fat. It can tell you about your muscle mass. It can tell you about the water content in your body, which we know varies uh, from day to day, right? If you're a woman, you know that at certain times of the month, you're going to retain more water, right? It's not fat, it's not muscle, simply water, and that's what happens. So it's good to know because, to give you another example, um, when I weighed myself beginning of June, uh, and then 27 days later, I was really amazed because in 27 days, I had not lost much weight. So I had lost one pound, 500 grams. And if I, that was the only number I had, I know, I know myself, I would have been disappointed, right? I would have decided, oh, everything that I've done is not working. Uh, I'm not going to reach my goal uh, for my 50th birthday, which is to be healthy, leaner, etc. So I would have probably been disappointed. But because on that scale, I had access to all the numbers, I could also see that my body composition had changed. And the most dramatic area where it changed was actually body fat. The body fat percentage at the beginning of June was 29%, all right? And by the end of June, it had dropped to 27. So in the course of 27 days, I had lost 2%. And that blew my mind because it really helped me understand that the weight by itself, just the kilograms or the pounds or whatever is your uh, unity of measurement is not accurate at all, right? So that was really a relief for me to see that, yes, the effort that I've put in, that I wanted to put in had actually paid. And I could see that thanks to those other numbers, thanks to the body fat. So that's why I wanted to offer it to you too. It's not just one number, the weight by itself, but it's more metrics. And really, the more metrics you have, the more information about our health. So what other numbers can we get, right? Other numbers, which are kind of objective too, right, neutral and factual, could be how fit are you, right? So there's your body when it's not doing anything, how heavy it is, how big it is when we tape it, when we measure it simply, but also what can we do with our body? Can that evolve, right? And I remember doing, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but the Beach Body DVD series, which are fitness programs like Shalene Extreme, for instance, with Shalene Johnson, which is about strength training, resistance training. And I love that. And I remember that before doing that, we would measure or health or fitness rather levels by, for instance, uh, how high we can jump, how many push-ups we can do, how long can we stand in a squat position, for instance, can we reach our toes when we bend over, right? So that could be also very interesting for us to explore. And we can also use a concept uh, that I use with my clients as far as food cravings are, con are concerned, which can also be relevant here in this area of measuring or fitness level or health levels too, it could be the diff. Diff stands for D is duration, I is for intensity, and F is for frequency. And basically, you could measure how long you can, you can do squats. For instance, is it one minute, 
10 minutes, a whole hour, I have no idea, let's, let's play with this. It could be also the intensity of your squats. Is it just pure body weight or do you add a weighted jacket, a weighted vest? Do you add dumbbells? What, what is it like? And also the frequency. Can you squat, you know, every day? Do you squat every day? or do you only squat once a month or once a year, right? So this could also help you refine, define what your fitness, your health is as far as fitness is concerned. So that's also objective because those are numbers and we could have, you know, just like for the Guinness World Record book, we could have somebody really assessing um, factually how, well, what the numbers are basically, right? So that's one thing. How fit are you? But also one thing that I think is extremely important is what is your perceived level of health? And if we go back to fitness, for instance, how fit do you feel? If I were to give you a scale from zero, not fit at all, to a 10, super fit, I've never been that fit. I feel super fit, super powerful, etc. Where would you say you're at, right? And this is subjective, but it's also extremely important, right? Because it's going to determine also where you want to go. Do you want to stay there or do you want to improve that, right? So that's really what I'm going to leave you today. What are the facts? What is the data you want to use to determine whether or not you're overweight or you're at the Norman range um, for, your, for your height, for your body, right? For your build too, right? So you can have access to all these measurements, the weight on the scale, but also the BMI, but also the waist circumference, but also the body fat percentage, the fitness level, the factual fitness level, but also the perceived subjective fitness level. And then once you've got all those numbers, what do you want to do with them? What is your opinion on those numbers? Knowing that, of course, even if it's much more than just a weight on the scales, a number on the scales, they also don't reflect the full picture, right? So what is your opinion on those numbers? And how do you feel when it comes to those numbers? When you feel this way, does it actually help you reach your goals, your weight loss goals, your fitness goals, your health goals, your happiness goals? And if not, then how do you want to feel? Same thing, you can check with yourself. Will this way of feeling actually help you reach your goal faster, more easily maybe? So when we think about health, there are really two things to consider that I think are super important. There's really a physical health, and that comes with the very objective data, the scientific data, right? The, the doctor's data. The more measurements you have about your body, the more accurate this picture of your physical health can be. But physical health is nothing without mental and emotional health. As I said, my BMI was always normal, actually. But for 30 years, I really struggled with my demons, thinking I was overweight, believing I was overweight, uh, really struggling when I was thinking about having cake, having a piece of chocolate, and then, yeah, but I should be good. I shouldn't have this, but, oh, who cares? And I deserve it. Let's have it. Oh, I see on Monday. You know, I'll start again on Monday and so on. And it was relentless. It was all the time in my mind, right? So that's the mental and emotional health I'm also talking about, right? We're going to explore that topic uh, over the course of this series. Next week, we're going to talk about weight loss per se, right? So of course, if you want to improve your health, both outer, but also inner health, it's possible for you. I really want you to hear this. It is possible for you, right? We can improve. We have control over things, right? So we know what to do, for instance. We know we, we've heard the advice from doctors, from researchers. We know. And so chances are it's a bit like a, a coin. There's one, one side where we know what to do. And on the other side of the coin, there are all the other things that we would want to do, even though we know that they're probably not serving you. That's where I come in. If you need help, I can help you focus on what's beneficial for you, right? I can help you decline, um, not give in to temptation when there's temptation. And we know that in our society, temptation is everywhere, right? It's everywhere on the street with 
well, I live in Paris, so bakeries are everywhere, grocery stores are everywhere, but also on TV, commercials are everywhere, right? You hear people talking about the latest restaurant, the, this delicious food that you really, really have to try. It's so sweet, it's so good, right? So temptation is everywhere. And that's why I help my clients. That's how I help them do that. Stop reacting, obeying the food cravings with no pose right? As if they were on autopilot. And the way we do that is simply by first understanding why do they want the food? That's the first step, understanding. The second step is actually to decrease the longing for the food. It's possible to do this. It's super fun too. And we do that on a regular basis. And of course, once you've declined, <laughs> once you've, sorry, decreased the longing for the food, it's super easy to decline the food easily right? When we no longer want the food so much, then it doesn't really matter, right? So that's what we do. Understand, decrease, decline. Super easy, right? So all you need, if you want help from me, all you need to do is reach out to me. You can reach out to me on Instagram via my DMs. It's nan.cezana.coaching. Or you can simply write to me with my email address, which is nscoaching at outlook.fr. Right. I'd love to hear from you and I'll see you next week on Instagram if you want to or on YouTube too. Next week we're going to talk about weight loss and I'm going to challenge weight loss again because I love challenging those notions of weight, overweight, weight loss so that you get super clear as to what you want. There's no right or wrong answer, you get to decide. Right? Your weight is not a problem unless you decide it is. So make sure you like your reasons and make sure you get the help you need if you want to. I'm going to wish you a very happy rest of your day. I hope it's not as hot where you are and when you watch this video as it is right now in Paris, because it is pretty hot. But in the meantime, until next time, I wish you a very pleasant day. Take care. Bye.